everyone. In this episode of Creative Spaces, we go and take a look at my good friend, Dave Stone Studio. Dave has been on tour with a number of bands, including LCD Sound System, The Melvins, and Phantomus. And Dave has put together his studio over many years, soaking up the advice from friends and bandmates. So let's go check out Dave Stone's Creative Space. Hi, my name is David Scott Stone. This is Surface of Mars. This is my studio. I've been building over the last 20 years or so. And um, I'm going to show you around it today. Cool. And like, what's some of the stuff you've done in the past? Like projects, bands you've toured with, your own projects? I've been a professional musician for a number of years, since the beginning of the century. I've played in many bands, traveling all around with uh, uh, the Melvins, uh, Unwound, The Locust, and LCD Sound System. The last 12 years I've been working as a music producer, recording bands uh, that generally want to hybrid between uh, live instrumentation and electronics. Uh, I've worked with everyone from noisy experimental people such as Black Dice to post-punk bands like uh, Gender and you know, we'll track drums in the other room, we'll get them recorded, and we'll start syncing them up with all these instruments. The 909 is probably my favorite drum machine. It is so punchy. It's, it's almost cliche to, to talk about like the power and the energy that this thing just creates just with its sonic design. Uh, pairs incredibly well with the SH-101. I bought from a band that was decommissioning a bunch of their old gear when they broke up. Oh yeah, MS-20, it's another classic crank up the resonance and this thing will just speak. Um, I feel like it's really, really underappreciated, uh, but I could do so much with just this synth. It's incredible. And you know, with all of my stuff, I never bought this stuff for top dollar. I got this when people were getting really, really into plugins and soft synths and stuff, drum machines, and they were unloading this stuff. So I certainly wasn't spending over, you know, several thousand dollars for this stuff. Um, you know, like this. Yeah, it's, you know, TB303. My friend who was in an experimental band uh, had one of these things and they weren't using it for anything that had to do with like techno or acid or house music or anything. They were just using it as more of a noise source and you know they asked me if I wanted to buy it because at one point I didn't want any synthesizers that had any keys on it. I just wanted to patch things together with my modular and all you know and then at some point I think probably you know, when I want to start producing, it'd be very difficult to work with other musicians uh, without keyboards. So I started buying some synths that had keyboards. And my modular system, I bought my, we'll get into this in a second. I got my uh, JX3P when I was still in high school. Um, it was being cleared away, it was super cheap. And then eventually my friend who had a studio sold me the PG-2000, it was like 50 bucks for that. Um, I was on tour with LCD and I was saving up my per diem money to buy synths uh, because I didn't know when I'd have that opportunity again. So I bought the JX3P literally on eBay when I was in Finland. The Jupiter 6. Jupiter 6. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Jupiter 6 I bought on eBay while I was on tour. Uh, uh, it was so incredibly cheap. I can't believe it. I love it. A lot of people don't like the synth, but I appreciate how well it fits in a mix. Don't have to do much EQ to it. This thing, um, the Oberheim Expander, it's just glorious sounding. Uh, it's a little bit finicky to program, but, you know, I, another synth that fits really, really well in the mix. Uh, during the pandemic, I set it up and for hours I would just learn how to program deeper and deeper with it. 
Uh, it's incredible because you can like run individual voices and run them with MIDI, CV, and gates on different voices. Um, it's just a really, really beautiful synth. Yep, Moog Voyager. That was the first modern synthesizer that I'd gotten. Um, I'd been playing with the Melvins, and we'd done some Melvins Phantomos Big Band. And all of a sudden I came back with a bunch of cash, and I started wanting to get into synthesizers again, just basically to make noises, not big old basses or anything like people use them for. Um, so I thought it, it would seem really reliable, it seemed really, really cool. And uh, it was the first time I ever reached out to a company and used the band card. And they gave me a really, really good deal on it. And I still love it. And I can say this, I haven't seen any Voyager clones yet. <laughs> Knock on wood. <laughs> uh, Juno 106, I mean, for 175 bucks, it's an incredible keyboard. They don't go for that much anymore, but you know, I'd seen so many friends of mine in bands and synth punk bands playing them and just throwing them across the stages. And uh, this one came up, had a couple broken voice chips, took the chips out, threw them in acetone, and bingo, six voices back. Um, the Roland Jupiter 4. I was on tour with LCD in Japan, and there was a shop that was selling a uh, ARP tw uh, 2600 for $1,500. So I went into the shop there, and you know you have to climb up five store, uh, five uh, five stories, and the shop is super tiny, and it's just a, it's almost a junk shop of synths. So I saw the ARP 2600, and literally it was falling apart. The faceplate was a complete mess, like the 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 wood. Yeah, you know, like it, it just seemed like it would have been dangerous to take back. I have my regrets because it was only $1,500. Um, but I asked them if they had anything else and they showed me this. It was an SH, uh, what do you call it? It was the Jupiter 4. They wanted 400 bucks for it. And I got it in a huge old vintage rolling case that it sat in. And then there was the problem about having to take it back. And I was literally I, I bought this cheap little stroller. I was rolling it across Shibuya um, Crossing, trying to go to a FedEx store. They wanted $1,500 to ship it back. I didn't know, I was gonna leave it with my friend Kato Man, but uh, the person that I was with, she was just like, why don't you take it on his carry-on? And so we showed up at the airport, 200 bucks back in the States. It's a gem, it's gorgeous sounding. It, uh, it's it's an emotional sounding synth. It has so much weight, depth. Um, like I can just play this thing for hours and hours, and it brings up feelings that just kind of like that send chills up my spine. And you know, it, it's generally synths don't do that for me. It's usually like a, guitars. And um, I love this thing. Your Peggier is fantastic on it. It's soft and wounded sounding. The ARP Odyssey, it was the third synth that I'd bought with a keyboard. Uh, I was trying to expand my modular. Uh, I mean, this is the days, this, I must have got this maybe 2005. It was maybe $600. And, you know, I wanted something as a uh, contrast to the modular stuff, um, the MS-20 and the Voyager. And, you know, I was starting to learn about different sorts of filter designs, envelopes, and how they can be so different from one instrument to another. And this thing, this thing is just like, you know, <clears throat> it was really, really great to get super heavy, psychedelic, swirly, noisy sounds out of this. Um, you know, mine wasn't working well for a long time, so I was kind of exploiting the sort of brokenness. But then I cleaned the filters and all the sliders, now it works 
exactly like it's supposed to. Let's see, the SP1200. Um, you know, like I used to think dance music was Aphex Twin and Square Pusher. I was completely not like hip to the culture and the community and the, his the history of dance music. Um, you know, people in, I had two very, very good friends of mine that were in, you know, I was playing with the Melvins. I was going to see bands like Black Dice, Wolf Eyes, Liars. And I had two really, really good guides. My friend Tyler Pope, who's an LCD, and my friend Nate Harrington, who's a music producer who lives in New York. And they would constantly flow things into me uh, about like dance music and that, you know, classic house tracks, classic techno, but also things that were going on in the early 2000s, a lot of minimal techno stuff, a lot of like new disco, all of those things. And so, you know, when I started playing with LCD, I was completely green to all of like this dance world stuff that they had come out because they were all 90s punks that got into dance music. I did not have anyone that I was around in Los Angeles to teach me about that stuff. So when I went there, I was listening to all the music that they were listening to and, you know, someone said, oh, just start with Daft Punk. <clears throat> and that sounds ridiculous because they're incredible and they're essentially a paradigm shift with electronic music. But <clears throat> I'd seen that they, you know, I started listening to them. It's like, oh, wow, this stuff is incredible. And, um, I saw that they were using SP 1200s, uh, and so again, this was something that no one cared about, like maybe in 2010, <clears throat> or it, they weren't going for the prices that they're going for now. So I picked this up. I also on tour, I forget what country I was in, but I ordered it on eBay. So when I came back from that leg of the tour, I would have all this new music gear. And I think I got for like 800 bucks. And, um, you know, and the thing that I love about this, you know, I tried all the classic things you're supposed to do with it, speeding up records and then slowing it down for all those aliasing and crunch and all. But when I started sampling my synthesizer, uh, my drum machines into it, it did something to my 909s, 808s, that just, you know, the punch that this thing gives to things that you might already have. It's so, so incredible. It's like, I'm basically made an, you know, an SP1200 sample pack. Like this one is 808, a DMX and a Lindrum. And it sounds a lot different than the hardware units that, of those things. When I have this set up and people come over and they just start punching things with this, you know, the kick drum and it's going through my monitors the energy and inspiration it creates just from the sound of it. Um, it's just a lot of fun. It helps people get in the mood yeah. uh, by just the sound of it. So um, immediate. It's so immediate. And this is my modular system. This, this was, this started really my love affair with uh, synthesizers. Um, Work, working as a guitar player for a number of years, and the way I played guitar was uh, when I would play guitar, I had all my effects pedals on a music stand. So as I was playing, I would have a looper on the floor. I could create loops, use an AV box, send it up through my music stand, and start processing the audio and not even having to play guitar. And then when it came to a section where I needed to like double buzz the guitar player of the Melvins, I could hit the AB box and all of a sudden go into a chord after doing this sort of sound design and soundscape. Um, and the way I played my effects pedals, sometimes I would be sending them back into themselves to get them to self oscillate. And my friend at one point said, oh, you're basically using your pedals like a modular synthesizer. And I was like, wait, what's a modular synthesizer? And he was like, oh, you know, those things that look like switchboards. And I was like, oh, right on. And I started looking into buying a modular synth system. I'd bought the Voyager and, you know, I saw these things like CV and gate out. I really didn't know what it was. And then after a few weeks of exploring that, I started buying some modules 
that were in kit form by this company called Blessette. Blessette. John Blessette, RIP. And I bought uh, a CV analog delay. I bought a really, really basic sequencer. And I started building these kits. At one point, then, my friend Joey Karam, who played in the Locust, was also getting into modular at the same time. He had a Voyager, we were both getting into modular. And he got hip to Paul Schreiber's MOTM system, Synthesis Technology. He showed me some of these modules and I really, really liked the form factor. I liked the fact that I could use quarter inch cables. So I started buying kits. Most of the modules I have here, and I have more modules, I have more modules than I have space. This is just like, if I'm playing a live set, this is what I have now. And like, I didn't build this one, I didn't build this one, but for the most part, you know, th this one is actually, I have some modules that were actually originally blast set that I converted to uh, 5U. And this is kind of, you know, this is a module that, I mean, I built 35 different modules. And here's one, this one's like, this one's a filter, but I don't know if you can see here, but I populated the whole circuit board uh, putting all the resistors, components, ICs um, into this. Um, flew all the wires to the front, to the, to the pots, the switches. And I was actually building these modules probably for about seven years. And the thing about the old Synthtech stuff, like it was very, very slow. This is 2002. Uh, it would take, you know, you maybe put a module order in and then four months later you get a quarter of the system. So, I mean, I really, really got to know the modules as I got them. I would get to know how to finesse and exploit the few modules I have so they would really, really integrate with themselves. The culture of modular wasn't like how it was now, I mean, 3U or your Iraq, you know, was basically just Opfer. And they made some cool modules, but, you know, um, you know, so you'd get very, very excited about a Syndustry Zero Oscillator when it came out, or if there was some sort of other module by, uh, you know, in Fritz. You know, you get a 5U faceplate, you wire it up. But, I mean, the modular, the, the, at one point, I only wanted to play modular synthesizer. Um, it wasn't uh, because I really, really just wanted to make, use it for noise and sound design. And, you know, in the 2000s, it was a very, it was just like all about aggressive, performative noise for me uh, and that changed you know I became a, a, a raver in uh, uh, 2011 uh, but before that you know coming out of playing with bands like Melvin's uh, you know Locust Unwound uh, doing harsh noise performances that you know underground DIY performance spaces you know, playing shows with just contact mics and, you know, uh, these homemade thunder sheets that I would build up just to get feedback off of. It was, you know, I still think to this day that my friends from the noise scene still don't understand, you know, my trajectory. I love the Moog Taurus. It is, it, one of my favorite pieces of electronic music that I've ever heard and not to be biased because I know the inner workings of things but yeah LCD sound systems yeah it the the rave up at the end of it is so incredible and it's not jammed it's by design it is so so incredible and this is what I saw them using Tyler Pope you know and when I saw this for, again, 175 bucks, had to get it. I use it all the time and it is so hard not to use it the way they use it in LCD, but I, 
am committed to trying to do things differently than them, but it is fantastic. Wurlitzer, we had these on stage in the band, never played it, but I would sit there at soundcheck and I even turned off. There was something about the keys hit resonating and hitting the times in it that just sent chills up my spine. I loved, loved the way it felt. And the only other instrument that had done that was like a jazz master for me. So, you know, these things weren't crazy money, you know, that long ago. And I kind of feel that actually instruments that are electroacoustic, spring-based, or magnetic tape, those are the hardest things to emulate. Like, you can get a pretty good Moog patch on Softson. But anything that, that can be a little bit off, like an electric piano, uh, a spring reverb, um, a tape echo, you know, it's a little bit, there's something a little bit uh, different. I mean, I'm someone that actually loves hybriding uh, hardware with uh, software. Like, I'm not some sort of analog purist, you know, I just, with most of this stuff, you know, I, I mean, for one, I never pay, paid top dollar for it. And sometimes I would wait weeks and weeks and weeks until I got something that was kind of in the range, if not months, that of something I could actually afford. And so I was very, very strategic with my, pur uh, my purchases. And with a lot of these synths or outboard gear, um, I, you know, a lot of my outboard gear I got at a time period when people were dumping outboard gear because they were using software. So I got some really, really good deals on the outboard gear as well, and that was essentially around 2010. I've been very lucky being involved with synthesizers, even though I'm a guitar player, for a long time. I've met some really, really fantastic people. I made some really, really good friends, and this is my friend Roman's uh, synthesizer, the Deckard's Dream, and it's a, is this four space or five space? I think it's four space. Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah. Hey. Um, and Deckard's Dream, it's a CS80 inspired replicant, uh, and it just sounds gorgeous. I use it for scoring, I use it you know, to practice uh, voicings of, of when I'm playing keyboards. Um, you know, it is, it, it, I do everything I can to avoid the cliches of the Vangelis Blade Runner sound. I love hooking up sequencers to it and doing um, poly sequencing with it to kind of get into these sorts of almost uh, Steve Roach sorts of, of uh, you know, brain dance sequencing. And it's gorgeous. It's, it's a really, really fantastic synth. And he's, he makes so many really, like, incredible things. Quality is fantastic. Uh, and he's a lovely person to support. Space Echo, you know, it's, again, one of these things that I think it's really hard to replicate in software. You can get really, really good emulations. You know, I had someone over the other week and they kind of didn't understand the concept and I took the lid off and they saw the tape in there and they were fascinated. I mean, I think if you're someone that's been around uh, music production or just making music for a long time, you kind of get the concept of the space echo and tape delay. Uh, I also have a really, really good full, tune, full tone tube tape echo that's based more on an echoplex I use. It's a different color, a different character. Um, but yeah, you know, I, I love sending things out from my patch bay into that to process audio that's coming out of uh, uh, Logic or Ableton, mostly Logic. Um, and it, it never ceases to amaze people what a tape echo can do to the sound of things. Moving right along, Art Pitch Transformer. A few years earlier, this would have been blue and it would have said MXR on it, but less people know about the ART. I think I've, I've seen some videos on it. They're probably expensive now. 
Uh, but I've always wanted one of these because besides the cool touch, uh, electrostatic touch changing of things, you know, you touch this and you can change the pitch of things and add regeneration feedback into it. And as you're going through a track, when you, let's say, you're processing drums, you could go, now every hit, it will have a different sort of uh, pitch to it that's regenerating, and you can do, you can play with this in a very, very musical way. It's, it's pretty cool. Saldano Surfbox. So I used to build amplifiers for Saldano uh, a long, long time ago when they lived in Los Angeles. And I love Fender Super Reverbs. It's my favorite guitar amp to this day. And I built a Solano SLO 100. Mike made a surf box. It was like one of a hundred and I had to get one. So I built it. And uh, it's a very, very short sort of reverb, but the tremolo and vibra actually the vibrato is gorgeous on this thing. The vibrato is so, so luscious. Um, Lexicon PCM uh, 41. It was the poor person's PCM 42, you know, everyone wanted a PCM 42, but thousand bucks versus 60 bucks. It, it, it's, it sounds really, really good. Your bond stuff, you know, those things were pretty cheap for a while. Uh, they're a little bit more clinical sounding, but they're really, really well designed. They, hold up pretty well and um, you know I'll use this sometimes on drum buses I'll use it uh, I've tried it actually on you know you know the two bus or the master out uh, master track uh, the warm audio stuff my god I'm so into these pull tech EQs that they did I didn't understand pull tech EQs whatsoever and, you know, <clears throat> I bought one and what it did to colder synths, like let's say the Jupiter 4, uh, the Jupiter 6, it, it, it had so much more character and I could kind of like um, surgically clean them up to take away the frequencies I didn't like. And it added a lot of uh, like nice harmonics to the signal. And then I started running things like 707 kicks through it and boosting it about 30 hertz with a little bit of cut to it. And it was like, oh my God, it actually brought things that sounded maybe a little bit more plasticky or what is it, PCM sorts of uh, uh, sounds to it. You know, that is 707, it's incredible. I'll run bass through it like bass guitar, guitar, I'll run snares through it when I'm tracking drums. But Warm Audio makes high, like really, really great quality kit. So at the recording station, I didn't know anything about this stuff until maybe 15 years ago. I had a Tascam Porta 2 four track recorder and I never really, really enjoyed it. it you know, I just, crank up the preamps and use as a guitar effect uh, distortion. Um, and for years I'd been to nice, really, really nice studios. When the Melvins would record, I'd be there with Joe Barisi or Garth Richardson and they'd be plugging in all these things. But this was all a complete mystery to me. Uh, I, was, I was at the end of the This Is Happening tour that I was playing guitar on with LCD and James records all of his own things. And, you know, having someone to talk to to demystify this process that seems completely impossible that you have to go to recording school to, uh, it was just so, so overwhelming. But I knew I wanted to get into recording, so I remember I was in Ireland. It was like the last run of shows that we were doing. And so I was like, hey, I want to get into recording. Can you recommend some pieces of gear? So he recommended some pieces of gear to me and I slowly started over the next year I started picking them up and you know I don't have everything that I uses but I I got some things 
that made a lot of sense to me that a lot of people, I should say, that a lot of people in the DFA world were using at the same time. Uh, Juan McLean, Nick Milheiser, uh, Marcus Lampkin. Uh, I had a lot of good mentors, and especially Matt Thornley, who lived here for a while and actually showed me how to use this stuff. But I love running things through the UA610. I've got a couple channels of these, the old DBX compressors, 165, uh, 162, uh, the 160, which, you know, this thing, it's, it was kind of busted when I got it. Didn't have the wood sides, but it was 175 bucks. Put another $100 into fixing it. Uh, from there, I started exploring other pieces of outboard gear. I got a Great River, I got an SSL 384 that someone had mislisted to be the the cost of basically a clone of one of these things. Um, save money, I built a Hairball Audio 1176 clone. Um, the, um, the Dynamite by Valley Peoples, it kind of matches the uh, look of the classic DBX VCA compressors. Um, and over the last few years, oh, and the Eventide H3000, which were so undervalued for a number of years. Um, you know, I process a lot of things through this. Sometimes it's even off and I'm just running it through the converters to add some character to it. Um, but, you know, from here, all of this stuff, I have a snake that I can roll out to my living room and set up uh, some microphones to retract drums. From there, it goes in the computer, get the drums together, process, come up with like a rough mix of them. And usually they're on some sort of grid at this point. So from there, I can send it all out to sequence live drums with the sequencers, the arpeggiators, synthesizers, and all of my synths go, the outputs, the audio outputs go to this part of my patch base so I can, instead of banjoing them across the room. I can go from here into the preamp. Um, and it's, you know, I try and, I mean, ultimately I, I didn't want this space to get away from the world in. I built the space to be a very, very jammable, like electronic music studio. Like, I feel like there's several different stations around here that some multiple people, well, mostly three people can work in here at once and kind of play off of each other and um, jam out and then we can kind of capture the good parts of that and create tracks and songs with it. But you know, I'm absolutely lucky, blessed to have had so many people over the years, especially from the world of DFA, to kind of mentor me and give me tricks and tips. Um, you know, I'm not talking to them all the time and all, but they demystified something to me that, you know, made it seem like you had to be a smart person to know or spent years of time going to recording school to do. And, you know, after I came back from that tour, I guess I could have spent tens of thousands of dollars to go to recording school, but instead I just bought the gear made mistakes for years and eventually learned how to use it.